So I'm an obstetric physician um, and I work uh, clinically 80% of the time, so this is quite a clinical talk about um, preeclampsia. And I'm going to start really uh, for the non-obstetricians, non-midwives, to just quickly talk about the definition of preeclampsia. Um, so hypertension in pregnancy is defined as uh, blood pressure greater than 140-90 on uh, two separate occasions at least four hours apart. And we can really uh, divide hypertension into those women that have chronic hypertension that predates the pregnancy or occurs at the beginning of or the first half of pregnancy. And that is different from those women who get hypertension in the second half of pregnancy. And that's split into women who have pregnancy-induced hypertension or gestational hypertension. And then there's preeclampsia, which is where you have the addition of hypertension tension and uh, proteinuria um, and we, we classify it as greater than 300 milligrams per 24 hours. We've touched on already HELP syndrome, which is again a clinical diagnosis of, of a constellation of symptoms, uh, hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes and low platelets and it's thought to be a severe form of preeclampsia. So the gold standard for diagnosing preeclampsia is hypertension and the presence of hypertension and proteinuria, which is a bit depressing, really, because it's the same as it was 100 years ago when our esteemed uh, gynaecologist, Victor Bonney, uh, uh, described preeclampsia. And um, we are getting a little bit uh, better at doing this, but at the moment, that is really our gold standard. In recognition of the more system systemic um, uh, um, effects of preeclampsia, in recent years uh, there have been uh, attempts to define preeclampsia in a, in a bit more of a, a widened, broadened broaden up their, uh, their definition. And the, in, in, uh, the uh, ISHIP, the International Society for the Study of Hypertension in Pregnancy, have come up with this diagnosis. So again, it is hypertension in the second half of pregnancy that is new onset together with a new onset of one of these following. So proteinuria and or maternal uh, organ dysfunction, and that might be renal insufficiency, liver involvement, neurological involvement, or uh, hematological abnormalities, including thrombocytopenia, DIC, and hemolysis. And obviously, that's what we're interested in today. Also, the presence of uh, evidence of utero-placental dysfunction, and that usually manifests, we can see that manifests as a fetal growth restriction. As Beverly's already alluded to, uh, women still die of preeclampsia in pregnancy. Uh, this is uh, data uh, over the last uh, sort of 10 years or so and shows that uh, we are, the deaths from preeclampsia is reducing. And indeed, in the last confidential inquiry that was published in December last year, showed the lowest ever recorded um, deaths from preeclampsia at 0.11 per 100,000 maternities in this country. If we look a bit closer at those deaths over the last three uh, triennium, what we can see is predominantly it is the reduction in deaths related to intracranial hemorrhage, and I think we are getting more aggressive about our treatment of, in particular, systolic hypertension that might have directly led to a reduction in these deaths. But we're not doing so well along uh, where, where we get the severe preeclampsia and the HELP syndrome, and women are still uh, dying uh, in this condition, and obviously that's pertinent for today. I also wanted to highlight, of course, that uh, worldwide preeclampsia and uh, severe preeclampsia HELP syndrome and indeed eclampsia um, are a leading cause of maternal death. So 99% of maternal deaths happen in developing countries, and of that, 14% are related to hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. So only, he only hemorrhage um, is uh, a higher um, uh, risk, or, or more women die of hemorrhage than, than hypertensive disorders in pregnancy, but it's the second most common cause. And it's important to also recognise that preeclampsia leads to a number of uh, problems with um, the neonate. Uh, it is one of the leading causes of premature delivery and also um, cost in neonatal care. So worldwide, it is still a major problem, e even though in this country we've, we've made uh, huge inroads and less women die from preeclampsia. There are numerous publications that look at risk factors. There are many risk factors that have been associated with preeclampsia. This is just, um, just one uh, publication. Um, and, of course, many of these are very common. So a lot of women have a combination of these risk factors. <clears throat> and so to the pathogenesis, and again, this is for the, the non-obstetricians and non-midwives here. Essentially, preeclampsia is thought of as caused by the, the uh, placenta, um, but the dysfunction happens in the endothelium, the maternal endothelium. So um, the story goes that this is, this is a spiral artery, so this is the, the myometrium here, this is the mother's side, and this is the, um, the uterine cavity here. And you have these, spinal, these spiral arteries, and this is the non-pregnant spiral artery. In normal pregnancy, there is trophoblastic invasion here into the spiral arteries that, that widens the spiral arteries to allow a high-capacitance, low-resistance 
um, in these spiral arteries, so to bathe the, the placenta in maternal blood. Um, and what, we've, what we see in, um, in preeclampsia, that this doesn't happen so much. So you get some trophoblastic uh, invasion, but not enough. And that sets up a small placenta with less capacitance and higher resistive indices. And at the time this is happening in the second trimester, you don't see any, any clinical problem because the baby's only this big. But as the baby grows, it outgrows the ability of this small, um, uh, abnormally formed placenta to provide for it. And at that point, uh, that's when the clinical sim symptoms and syndrome uh, manifests. So th the story goes that it's poor placenta in the poor placentation in the first half of pregnancy, leading to oxidative stress of the placenta. Uh, and this um, leads to factors that cause dysfun dysfunction of the maternal endothelium and a maternal inflammatory response and the clinical signs of preeclampsia in the second half of the pregnancy. So if we think of preeclampsia not as a placental disease, uh, but we think of an end endothelial dysfunction disease, it's, it's completely understandable that, therefore, this is why we get such a constellation of clinical signs and symptoms. We get renal problems, liver problems, blood problems, including TMA, of course, um, uh, neurological problems, um, and uh, uh, problems with pulmonary edema. And, of course, we mustn't forget the baby. Fetal syndromes uh, related to preeclampsia, including intrauterine growth restriction, again, completely explainable if you've got a small placenta that doesn't work very well. Placental abruption is more common, so this is the, the baby side of the placenta, this is the maternal side, there's a big clot here, this is a placental abruption. Stillbirth, fetal distress, and, and preterm birth, as I've already said. As we've understood the biology of preeclampsia a bit more, we realise it's not just oxidative stress. There are other factors that might lead to this poor placentation. They may be genetic. Natural killer cells might have a, a role. Uh, uh, antibodies to angiotensin II receptors might heighten hypertensive response. And there'll probably be other factors that we will find. But it's not just oxidative stress. It's a, it's a multifactorial, if you like. There's also been a lot of work recently on what the connection is between the placenta and then this endothelial dysfunction. And, and uh, what we found is that there, are, uh, there is essentially an imbalance in the anti-angiogenic and angiogenic factors. Uh, and there are anti-angiogenic factors like S-flit and uh, soluble endoglin that are secreted in the placenta uh, that lead to uh, endothelial dysfunction um, by affecting uh, the angiogenic factors and signaling of TGF-beta and also mopping up of angiogenic factors like P PLGF, placental growth factor, which lead to this disordered imbalance um, in the endothelium um, and uh, uh, creation of, of, of uh, vasoactive substances and procoagulant factors, as Beverly has always talked about, and obviously at that point, this is where the TMA comes in. This was the sort of the seminal paper that really looked at S-flit and, and PLGF for the first time. It was actually a, a study. It was a study from um, a, a different study, and they used the serum um, from that study to to characterise this. And they took 120 women with preeclampsia and 120 um, uh, gestation match controls. And what they showed is they, got, they had serum levels from all these different gestations. And what they showed the control group, S-flit, was pretty much the same throughout most of the pregnancy until the final uh, sort of eight weeks or so, and then, and then, and then started to rise. So the anti-angiogenic uh, elements started to rise. Um, but in those that were going to get preeclampsia, they had a rise that was earlier, and it was greater. And in those with the clinical symptoms, already there was a significantly elevated uh, level of S-flit. Concomitantly, the, an the angiogenic factors were reduced. So in, in normal pregnancy, what they found was the angiogenic factor PLGF increased during uh, the first two-thirds of pregnancy, and over the last eight or ten weeks or so, it, it drops, and that's in normal pregnancy. In those w women with preeclampsia, there was less of a rise, and then there was a more of a fall. And in those with the actual clinical symptoms, PLGF were in very low levels. So this has led to uh, a couple of commercial companies, or several commercial companies, developing assays. This is just a, a test of one, which uses just PLGF. There's another one, which is S-flip PLGF ratio, uh, to see whether we can use these diagnostically for preeclampsia. And this is just one of the studies by Lucy Chappell's group, uh, which this is shows the, the rock curve here. So what they've done is they, they've looked at the PLGF compared to five other signs or tests used for preeclampsia. So me as a clinician at the moment, not having access to PLGF, I will look at the patient's blood pressure, their systolic and diastolic blood pressure. I'll look at their blood tests, including urate or NALT, and also whether they've got proteinuria or not. 
And that's how these tests do in terms of their sensitivity and specificity for diagnosing or diagnosing the requirement for delivery because of preeclampsia within 14 days. Compared to PLGF, which had a much better sensitivity and specificity of, of, of predicting this requiring delivery within 14 days. And this was particularly true in the preterm preeclamptics. This assay doesn't work so well for term preeclamptics. This, this, these were in women who, who are um, uh, up to 35 plus zero. And it, again, this is, shows the same thing, but if you aggregate these, um, these usual tests and, and, and signs together, even aggregated together, they still haven't got a great sensitivity and specificity. But if you add the PLGF to that, again, you get a much better sensitivity and specificity. And actually, PLGF plus those signs and, and tests are no, no better than just PLGF on its own. So this is actually a really good test for, uh, for, for diagnosing the requirement for uh, delivery within 14 days in women uh, who are preterm preeclamptic. At the moment, there are further studies going on um, with these assays to see where the best use of them will be from, an, uh, from a health economic point of view, whether it will be in a rule out or, or rule in, and whether we're going to be using it for all preeclamptics or just uh, those uh, preterm preeclamptics. So to Maha, so this is almost a similar slide to what uh, Beverly just showed. So if you're presented with a woman with Maha in pregnancy on the puerperium, what you're going to do is you're going to say, is this pregnancy associated or is this non-pregnancy associated? And the reason for that is the pregnancy associated Maha will uh, benefit from delivery if they haven't already delivered, and the non-pregnant associated Maha will, do, will, will um, benefit from uh, the uh, treatments that we're about to hear in the, in the following talks. As Beverly has already said, you can get that sort of picture from somebody who's having massive obstetric hemorrhage. Um, and uh, uh, so they may have uh, blood all over the floor or all over the sheets. Occasionally, unfortunately, they may have concealed hemorrhage and therefore you, th they've got blood all over their uterus, but you, you can't see it yet. And also sepsis might, might cause it. But if we take out these ones where they'll have a serious disruption to their coagulopathy and hopefully you'll have other signs and symptoms that will make you allow you to make this diagnosis, we're left with these three here and it's about making a decision about whether there's any one of these three or usually these two here. And that's the critical de uh, decision you need to make. And in practice, in real life, it's very, very hard. This is a table taken from the British Society of Hematology Guidelines for the Diagnosis and Management of TTP and other thrombotic microangiopathies. And it's helpful because it has all of this. What the, these are the things that can happen, and these, this is your differential diagnosis. But looking at that, you think, oh, God, there's a lots of you know, crosses and, and minuses and pluses and lots of pluses and two pluses. And actually, in real life, what we're saying is that these women could have any of these in any of these orders and you've got to kind of fathom which one it possibly is and usually you have to do that reasonably quickly because these women are very sick. So the first thing we've got to think about is incidence and the first thing to say is preeclampsia is by far the most common cause of this. So uh, preeclampsia affects 2 to 8% of pregnant women, depending on the, on the um, population studied. And HELP syndrome affects around 10% of preeclamptics. Occasionally, you can get the hemolysis elevated liver enzymes before you get the hypertension and, and proteinuria, so they can catch you out. But usually, the, the hypertension catches, catches you in the end, and, and they do become hypertensive. Acute fatty liver of pregnancy, much, much rarer. And then you've got the TTP and HUS, which again is probably rarer still, but it is the one that you need to, to um, exclude. So life isn't like textbooks. Patients haven't read the textbooks. They don't know what they're meant to do. And what we have to do is we have to recognize it is a spectrum. And somebody might start off looking like a bog standard preeclamptic, and actually they might transition to something entirely different. And so you must, must be prepared to make the initial diagnosis, but be completely prepared to change that diagnosis depending on the clinical scenario and how, um, how the uh, patient or their patient clinical symptoms respond. And I think part of that is about um, uh, MDT and, and uh, co-sharing uh, decision-making. And one of the things I find most useful is the obstetricians. So if they ring you up and they say, I don't think she's got preeclampsia, you need to sit up and you listen and you go and see the patient. Because obstetricians know a lot about preeclampsia. They, they manage it all the time, every day. 
And then, you know, and, and most of the women, all of them, all, almost all women get better. And if, as a haematologist, you're being rung up by a consultant obstetrician saying, I'm just not happy, something's not right, they're not behaving like I expect them to do, that's a really important sign. It's probably the most important sign that you should be over in delivery suite looking at them straight away. I don't have time to talk about management of, of, of a hall of preeclampsia, but just to say that in women who have preeclampsia or HELP syndrome and TMA associated with that, essentially it is supportive treatment. The, the definitive treatment is delivery, but in order to aid delivery and make sure that you're not causing more harm than good, you've got to do a bit of uh, sorting them out beforehand. So in, before you deliver them, you need to get their blood pressure under control. You need to give them magnesium sulfate <clears throat> to reduce the chances of eclampsia. You need to correct their coagulopathy to reduce the chances of major obstetric hemorrhage around the time of delivery. You need to make sure you've got decent fluid balance so you don't overload them and push them into pulmonary edema, which they're vulnerable for, and then you deliver them. And then after that, it really is a watch and wait, and occasionally they get a lot worse before they get better, but really, if you've managed to make sure that they're not hypotensive and they've bled horribly and all the rest of it, the rule is they tend to get better, um, and we just have to, to watch and wait, even if they need a bit of dialysis before they get better. They tend to get better. So in conclusion, preeclampsia and HELP-associated TMA is by far the most common TMA associated with pregnancy, and life isn't like the textbooks. Uh, a firm diagnosis of the cause of TMA is difficult in the acute setting. Uh, HUSTTP is the one to exclude um, as the treatment is different, and you need to be prepared to change your diagnosis um, if the patient is not behaving as you expect them to do so. From the point of view of pregnancy, um, they benefit, uh, TMA, pregnancy specific TMA benefits from optimization prior to delivery, then delivery, and then a watch and wait approach and, and a supportive uh, treatment. And there are new biomarkers um, that are likely to revolutionize uh, the diagnostic accuracy of this disease. Thank you very much.